911. It's a number dialed over 240 million times each year. In all cases, these calls are answered by trained professionals, and many are certified NINA ENPs. Let's talk to one of these professionals, unedited and completely off the cuff. Are you positive he's breathing? No. Okay, and he's blue? Yeah. Okay, then he, there's a good chance he's not breathing. Is there somebody else there that can do CPR? Oh my God. 911, what's your emergency? NINA, the National Emergency Number Association, and the Nancy Approved Standards Development Organization, has created the Emergency Number Professional Accreditation, specifically for public safety professionals. ENP certification establishes the benchmark for performance, signifying a broad-based competence in the public safety field. Successful certification completion demonstrates an individual's mastery of the knowledge base requirements for an emergency management position. So join me as we talk to yet another new ENP, unedited and completely off the cuff. Hey Fletch, welcome to another episode of Off the Cuff, True Confessions of an ENP. This morning we're talking to Danica Lovell, ENP of the Alachua County Sheriff's Office. She's a communications commander there. Good morning, Commander. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about Danica. Um, I started in 911 when I was 18 years old. Um, I had a letter from my guidance counselor at my high school saying I was on track to graduate um, instead of a diploma that they require whenever you apply. Um, <clears throat> I applied, I got hired, and I immediately fell in love with what I was doing every day, which was answering 911 calls. Um, I am in a relationship with the most phenomenal man for the last five years um, and his three children. Um, so <clears throat> fulfillment outside with three kids and then fulfillment every day that I'm here at the, here at the job. The most wonderful man you ever met. Yeah. I've never met you before. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's great. So what is, what does he do for a living? Um, he is a Sergeant at our jail. Oh, okay, great. Mm -hmm. So he kind of got the public safety family thing. Going. Oh yeah. Wow. No, that's great. And and you were telling me before your dad was actually a deputy. Yes. My dad retired from Columbia County Sheriff's Office, which is um, only about 30 miles north of Alachua County. Um, he was there 20 plus years before he retired. And my mom works with the courthouse um, up in Columbia as well. Okay. So Alachua County now. So that's what, Orlando, Miami? Because that's Gainesville. the only big place that exists in Florida, right? For us <laughs> northerners. Yep. It's Gainesville, so home of the Gators. Yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's a beautiful area up there. So I was, I lived down in Florida for five years back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a child of the 1900s. I saw a t-shirt the other day. Like, that was great. But uh, yeah, up up in that area, it's all horse farms. It's countryside. Mm -hmm. You actually have some hills and terrain. Mm -hmm. It's really, really gorgeous up there. Mm -hmm. Now, Gainesville is a little bit of a city. It is. But, um, you know, I would say it's a medium-sized city, right? I think so. Yeah. Comparatively, we're we're decently sized, but we're not anywhere near the population of Orlando or Miami. Um, but the the area in which we cover is it's pretty large. It's comparable, but the people not nearly as close to the number of Orlando. So that's what's interesting, really, about areas like that, because uh, where I am in New Jersey is very far. I'm about 45 miles out of New York. Mm -hmm. So it's very remote, very rural up by me. You know, uh, the town I live in now probably only has maybe, I don't know, six, seven thousand people in it. The town I grew up in had maybe 10 or 11,000. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody knew everybody. Everybody knew everybody's kids. Yeah. We knew all the local shop owners. And that's kind of probably where you live as well. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I grew up in a small town just outside of um, Gainesville. So, yeah, we, we know everybody. You know everybody's kids. Um, my stepchildren are going to school with kids, I with parents, kids that I grew up with. So, right. yeah, it's it's the same thing. My kids have some of the same teachers I had in high school. So. So the, the one problem you guys have with dispatch is you get the phone calls. Yeah, there's a car wreck out on the highway where Luther's old place used to be five yep. years ago when it burned down. That's right. And and a new dispatcher's like, what? 
I have no idea where that is. How do you deal with that rural side of things? Um, so a lot of us, we, we make sure that we praise and we preach. Like if you don't know where it is, somebody in the room does. Mm -hmm. So just mute your phone, stand up and yell for help because somebody Where's knows Luther's where that is. Place. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah. somebody can tell you the exact address or yeah. ride around to get you to that right place because we've been here forever. Sure. And criminal mm -hmm. history, you don't need to look in the file. You know the guy and you know his whole history. Yeah. yeah. Yep. You know, everybody is a frequent flyer up there, right? That's yeah. true. <laughs> yeah. So how many people are in your center on shift during one shift? Um, we are, we're supposed to have anywhere from 17 to 23, I believe. Wow. On okay. one shift. So that's a pretty big area that you guys mm -hmm. must cover then. Yep. What, give me an idea of, of, of the area geographically. Um, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't know. A lot of it's farmland. So I don't, I don't know for sure, like how many square foot it is. Um, <clears throat> but we cover, um, we cover Micanopy, which a lot of people look on the map and they say it's a, it's spelled like my canopy. <laughs> um, so we cover like down in that area, which is the same town that, um, the Michael J. Fox movie was filmed in, um, okay. where he was the doctor. Yeah. Doc Holliday or Doc something. Hol yes. Doc yeah, Hollywood. Okay. I think. Yeah. Doc, that movie Doc was Hollywood. Filmed, right. It was filmed in Micanopy. Um, so we have that area. We go all the way out to what's called Newberry, which is a, it's a larger small town. Um, but their graduating class is probably about three or 400 people. Um, and then we have the city of Alachua, which has their own police department and their own dispatch center. However, we're the only peace app. Um, but the farmland is significant um, in our area. However, we also have the University of Florida. Um, so we have a lot of students and a lot of um, transplant residents that have come from all over to go to the University of Florida and Chance Hospital. Sure. And, and that, that's a challenge in itself because you've got the disparity in phone calls. You know, oh, yeah. one day there's a cow in the street. The next call, you know, could be something else that's that's very urban related. Yep. And, and you've got to switch gears very fast. See, when I dispatched 100 years ago, it was all, you know, hey, Fletch, you know, everybody knew who it was. <laughs> I knew who it was. I knew where they were. It wasn't much of a big deal. And mm -hmm. it was all very rural. But uh, I never really had to switch. Heck, we didn't even have 911 back then. It was just seven digit lines. But, um, you know, that that's how it how does that affect your training? Because you did training for a few years, right? I did. I was in training for, I think, three to four years. Um, I was one of the what we call our training specialists. Um, so <clears throat> we actually spend our academy, I think, is anywhere from 10 to 12 weeks. I'm not exactly sure right now. Um, but we do an entire week on just geography. Actually, I'm, I'm sorry. It's two weeks now. It's two weeks. We do two weeks on geography where you do instruction. This road starts here, ends there. It changes names all, at all these places. And then the next day you actually take them out to ride that area. Oh, wow. So, so yeah, we take them out. We drive them around and we're like, this is, this is where people will call this is the old where they say the old cash and carry is. It's now a furniture store. Um, yeah, perfect example, old. right? Oh yeah, down by the old cash and carry. Right. The old cash and carry burnt down five years ago, or it's a furniture store now. Right. right? That's yeah. local history. So that that brings up an interesting point. A lot of people say, and I, and I'm one of those people that's a technology person. How many peace apps do we need in the U.S.? I say you can get away with three. Mm -hmm. East, Central, and and West, and big centers. Mm -hmm. Oh, but then you need local knowledge. Okay, right. you do need local knowledge, but you could staff those centers with local people mm -hmm. without having to move those people now. Right. So you can get local knowledge mm -hmm. consolidated, but in an area like yours, there's like really, really deep local knowledge. Oh, yeah. Like the old cash and carry. Right. That you know, how do you think you deal with that, but still collapse uh, into a larger center? Even at a county level, that's got to be difficult. Yeah. Um, so writing them around and showing them like this is what they used to say. This is um, how people um, 
call stuff in. Um, these are what our regular callers call about this intersection. Or um, when you're standing at this intersection, just realize that there's a McDonald's, there's a Publix. However, when we drive five miles north, guess what? There's a McDonald's and there's a Publix. Right. So you've really got to make sure that you're paying attention to their, their phone pings or the other locations that they're giving you because you can't always trust I'm at the Publix on Newberry Road because there's four. Yeah, yeah. I always joke around in Orlando. You know, you know you're in Orlando when you can look around and see five pawn shops, mm -hmm. a, a nightclub, and you know, <laughs> and an ABC liquor. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay. That's repeated a hundred times throughout the town. Oh yeah. No, that's difficult. So where do most of your employees come from? Are they local? Or are they in the county? What, um, what's, your, what's your standard profile? So our standard profile is um Currently, we've got a lot of young ones. We've got um, we've got like a huge like break in generation. I think we have a lot of people that are close to retiring, and then we have a lot of people that graduated high school and did the state curriculum actually in their high school. It's embedded as like a elective um, or vocational credit in their high school, and then we hire them straight from there. Um, but we have a lot of people like me that have also been here. 16, 15, 16 years. Um, <clears throat> so, but when you look around, a lot of them are all either from here or they migrated here for college or, and decided, oh, I love it. I'm going to stay. So it's very different. Um, we have a lot of people who lived in the city of Gainesville and never saw any parts of the county until mm -hmm. they started working here and they drove them out there and they were like, who knew these cow fields existed? Right. And then you have people that never came to the city like me. I think I came to the city to go school shopping every year. And I'm like, oh, who knew that we actually had a campus here? So it's it's a wide variety of people and backgrounds and um, age groups. Right, right. Well, that that's interesting. You know, in Florida, is such a melting pot. You get all these mm -hmm. different cultures and people, and I think that evolves and changes over the years. It was way different when I lived there, you know, umpteen million mm -hmm. years ago. And it, and you can go 20, 30 miles, and you run into a whole new different culture yeah. in Florida. Daytona Beach has got its own culture. <laughs> Jacksonville, even St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. Those three areas, which are not that far apart, yeah. on the East Coast, have three very distinct different cultures. Yep. And then you get down below Cocoa into Miami and that area. That's a whole different culture. It is. Ethnically, people-wise, food, every everything. Yes. It's almost a different state. Um, so when you get these large geographic areas, mm -hmm. like Gainesville up there, the area that you guys must cover, I mean, that's just such a diverse mm -hmm. area in everything right you've got big city and you've got rural farmland oh, yeah. i can't imagine handling all that out of one center and being able to pivot like that that's yeah. got to be tough it's somehow we have over the many years that we've been functioning somehow we have learned how to train it um <laughs> you've learned how to train the pivot you've learned how to train the call types you've learned how to train the geography um, because that's what the biggest thing that we preach on is you don't have to be from here because we can teach you. We can right. teach you how to be from here. Um, our, we are so lucky that our, um, addressing is actually, it's like a grid system. So you have first Avenue, second Avenue, and you have different quadrants. All the addresses in the Northeast part of the County are going to have a Northeast address. So right. like we've even the rural roads, even the rural roads. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So we've addressed it to where if you say you're in High Springs, which all of our addresses are going to be Northwest. If you say you're in a Southwest address in High Springs, we know you're not in our county. Yeah. So yeah we're yeah, able yeah. to get you the help as we're able to get you help quicker because we can give you to that other county as soon as you start giving us that address. Right. Or your ears go up and you start questioning. Yeah. You really know where you are. Right. Yeah. yeah now that's interesting. That's interesting. So that's so. How did you get into? What made you focus towards public safety? Was it your dad and the public yeah. safety element? What's he think about you working in public safety? Um, he's very proud of me. He um, supports. He supports my career. He thinks that I'm doing I'm doing good for how young I am. Um, but he um, he wanted me to. He want 
he always wanted me to do something bigger. Um, my biological mother suffered from a lot of mental health issues. So I'm adopted by my stepmom. Um, so he wanted to make sure that we broke that generational chain of issues of mental health issues and we're able to become something more and use that in our background to make other people better too. So he's proud that I'm able to do that every day while I'm here um, with my employees, as well as with the people that call 911, making sure that we remain understanding and compassionate with the people who are suffering. Um, so that's one of the biggest drives I had was I wanted to do something with mental health, really to understand why I was put through everything I was put through as a kid. Um, but I want to help the other side of it. Like, I don't want other children or other people to go through what I went through and the things that I saw. How do you think that helps you with dispatch or well-being? Um, it, it helps me recognize a lot of issues. So <clears throat> it helps me recognize when somebody's run down. It helps me recognize when um, one of my employees is suffering with compassion fatigue. Like, hey, you need a, you need a couple days off. You really need to refocus and um, refocus on your career, refocus on yourself, really, to make sure that you're taking care of you. Um, <clears throat> and it makes me recognize when somebody's really struggling, even outside of here. Um, I... I lost my brother to suicide um, about two and a half years ago. Oh, sorry so, to hear that. Yeah, it, it's really tough. Um, but it really helps me refocus on the people that are struggling every day and recognize some of those signs to be able to help them and say, hey, I, I really think you need help. Here's some resources. Here's what we can do to help you um, and, and better them because in reality, me as a supervisor, I'm only as good as my call taker. I'm only as good as my employee. And if they're not here that day mentally, I, there's something I need to do to fix that. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, suicide assistance is something that, you know, I worked on the 911-988 standard. Yeah. And I never realized the amount of, and I was shocked, quite frankly, on the uptake of 988. Yeah. And how many phone calls it was getting in the awareness. Mm -hmm. And and boy, I'm telling you, text, phone calls, and, you know, multimedia video, all of this. And I never would have thought that the technology side would have really helped. And I, I quite oh, frankly, yeah. I was shocked. And, yeah. and what, a, what a great effort. And that that is such a bigger segment than 911. I would yes. have never thought that. Yeah, I can't imagine um, how much they're getting, especially here in our college town, like we, we receive a lot of calls where people are grasping for help and grasping and needing that type of assistance, or they, they really just need a night. They need help. They need one night in a facility away from everything to just take a break. Um, decompress. Yeah. Decompress. And it's overwhelming at the because of Gainesville having so many different cultures and so many different people. Like we have people that are over here that still have an overseas phone number whenever they call 911 um, because they're here getting their doctorate or getting their education. So a lot of those people not knowing where to turn in order to get those resources locally, it's, it's overwhelming. So 988's really definitely helped us be able to help them better. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, as, as someone who is very close to that incident, how did that make you feel when you were taking those types of calls? <laughs> or was that a mental strain on you? Oh, yeah. Um, I remember um, shortly after I came back, after my brother passed away, we had a very similar incident. Um, and the my brother was 20, 20 when it happened. Um, and we had a 17-year-old pass the same way, and his mom found him, which is uh, very similar. My parents found my brother. Um, <clears throat> so hearing that mom on the 911 call, and I wasn't even taking the call. I could hear it through somebody's headset across the room. Like it broke me because that all I could hear was my mom's voice. Um, so yeah, I definitely had to refocus, leave, leave the job for the day because it was not, it was not going to work for me. Um, and thankfully through the entire process of losing my brother and the mental health issues that my, my birth mother had for me, well, had towards me, um, 
I had already been seeking therapy and been going to therapy regularly. So refocusing and going back to therapy to deal with and grieve my brother, um, it was the best thing I could have done for myself and for other people to take the loss of my brother and use it to help other people not be successful or not even think about and get them the help that they need with suicide. Wow. Thanks, Tanika. I mean, thanks for sharing that. I mean, that's, that's such a great story. And I'm, and I'm, you know, I really appreciate you, you sharing that side of it because I think it's important. Call yeah. takers need that mental support, right? And, and mm-hmm. it's, some people look at it as a crutch or I'm not strong or right. a, it'll affect the way people look at me. You know what? Yeah, it does affect the way people look at you. It makes me feel sorry for you and want to help. Right, it makes it me me. I don't look at you negatively for that. My God, how it, how I can't even imagine what it right. would be like to have to listen to that because I've never been through that. So yeah. it's so important to share those stories. I think that's a great part of therapy. Yeah, and that's the one thing that um, when I was in training um, before I lost my brother, and even when I go back and teach some days now, that's the one thing I say is when you look at the person next to you, they've been through something just as traumatic or more traumatic than you've been through. So talk to them. If you feel like you're dealing with something traumatic or if you feel like you're dealing with something that's tugging at you, I can promise you that somebody next to you has had those same feelings and just talk to them because they, they want to help you. Everybody in here wants you to show up tomorrow. Everybody wants you to remain alive, remain here. So talk to them because they want, they want you. Why do you think wellness awareness is such a big issue in this industry? I mean, it really is festering when you look at it. Mm -hmm. I, I think that some of us are still, especially like rural counties and, old school counties are still struggling with understanding that, Hey, this is real. Hey, this happens. Um, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay to not be okay. It really is. Um, it's just how you deal with it and how you function from it and what support you have. And, um, that's the one thing that I, I tell everybody in here, like, even if you leave, if you don't decide to work here, if you go to another County and you're struggling, call me, I got you. I will always have your back. Um, and I preach that every day. Like, no matter who you are, I care about you. So. No, that's so important. And, and again, thanks so much for yeah. sharing that. It's, uh, you know, it's not it, it's not an easy thing to talk about. But I think, you know, that's part of therapy too, right? Getting it those is. emotions out and, and getting that support. That helps you understand it's okay not it to is. be okay. And, and there, there are other people that are just the same and the worse. And, and yeah. everybody together can help out. So, okay. Well, anyway, listen, why did you decide to become an ENP? Oh, I needed something more. Um, I, in 16 years, I've promoted pretty much as high as I could go um, by keeping my head down and staying focused on the job. So I needed something more. I needed something to really justify my knowledge that I felt like I had um, to, to prove it to myself that, Hey, you, you are smart. Yeah. You, when it comes to 911, you're, you got this, you're smart. So I needed that, that certification, that piece of paper to prove to myself that. Cool. And, and what, when you made that decision, do you remember that day you made the decisions that I'm ordering the book? (laughs) So, um, our E911 director had actually ordered me, I think, three different versions because <laughs> I had committed to it three different times and something always happened. Um, I, when I was back in training, he ordered me, I think, like one of the version fours. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Then we got so busy um, revamping our policy, revamping our training module. Um, we were, um, that's when we were trying to like, revamp our um, training academy because we got the, it's sort of the Department of Health, our state curriculum and our state certification. So <clears throat> we were making sure that we could teach that as well. And at that time we were actually hosting the state curriculum to other agencies in our jurisdiction. So I was like, I'm, I'm too busy. I can't study it now. So then version five came out and I'm like, oh, I really, really need the new version if I'm going to start studying. So I got promoted to a supervisor and I was like, I'm going to do it. Now that I'm a supervisor, I really need it. Nope. 
Nope. Got too busy <laughs> on the job. I worked day shift, which was always busy. Um, when I got promoted to commander, I went to night shift and I was like, you know what, if I don't actually commit to this, I'm never going to do it. So I committed to it about two years into being a commander. Um, right about, right about last summer is when I really, really committed to it. Um, and I'm like, you know what, I need this for myself. If I, all I'm doing is putting myself second, putting myself second. Um, and I really need to be number one in my, in my mind right now. No, that's great. That's great. And did you take the test remotely or did you go sit at a center? So I took the test in the center. I actually failed the first time. Okay. <laughs> um, I that's failed right. it. I failed it by three questions. <laughs> the very first time. <laughs> um, and then I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to retake it. Um, and you're like, if I didn't get that stupid call from the cash and carry, I got yes. to study five more minutes. <laughs> I could have. Yeah. But um, I was really struggling the first time I took it to really understand the call, call routing path. Like okay. the, the big images of how it all, I couldn't get it. Like it wouldn't, it wouldn't stick. Um, and I felt like every question I had was on that. I'm like, every time I hit next, it was another call routing question. And I'm like, hmm, dang. So um, I took it. And when I got the letter that I had failed, I was like, all right. And then um, my agency actually had paid for the first time. Um, and they were like, it's okay. A lot of people fail the first time. It's not that big of a deal. Um, and then they were like, well, if you want to take it again, you've got to wait until after October mm -hmm. because we don't have the funds right now. Um, Cause we ended up sending four dispatch, five dispatchers to APCO and we sent three people to Nina um, cause it was here in Orlando. So they were like, we don't have the funding to be able to pay for a retest. And I was like, that's fine. I'll re I'll pay for it. Um, so while I was looking at it and waiting for the time to actually, um, come to be able to register the people that work for me actually raised their own money and put it in a card for me, for me to be able to retake. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Phenomenal. Phenomenal people. Oh my God. Oh my God. That, yeah. that just, that, you know, I, I hear these stories about dispatch and the things they do for each other and, Boy, I, you know, I just, you just don't see that anywhere else in this yeah. world. And how sweet is that? Yeah, it was so great. I, I'm tearing up now, but I cried like a baby when they gave it to me. It was well, like. I can, I can imagine. Yeah. So how did you, how did you do the second time through? <laughs> did the, did the call oh, routing demon show up? It did. It showed up. Um, but I actually only passed it by eight questions. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Because that cool. call routing demon was still there yeah. just nagging at me. That's okay. You know what? <laughs> People think, oh, I got to get a 95 or a 97. And you know what? The average passing score is not that much higher than 70%, which is the minimum, the pass fail. Yeah. Most people, though, I would say the bulk of the people don't score over 80%. Yeah. It it's a hard test. It's so hard. It's the best thing I can say is it's so hard. It's meant to be hard. You know, but but when you go to your doctor, do you want to go to your doctor and say, oh, yeah, I passed by two questions. Right. That test was easy. Well, yeah. I, think, I think it'd be a little harder maybe. So, so it's important stuff. It's such a wide berth of knowledge across mm -hmm. the board, you know, from HR policy to staffing yeah. to call routing. Yeah. So, but you know it now, right? Uh, enough to enough to get there. Enough to raise your hand and ask. Yeah. I know where to go to find the answer, which is that's, what's the most important. That's all you need. Where do I go to find the answer? Yep. That's half the battle right there. Well, no, that's that's fantastic. So what what would you recommend from a study? perspective what worked for you after i mean and i hear this all the time these start and stop start and stop mm -hmm. life happens work happens yeah. personal stuff happens whatever what worked for you to finally get you to go i'm taking the test um i think it was 
honestly, I, do, I don't really know. It was literally just, I'm on night shift. I feel like I'm just here. Um, I need, I need something to do. So I'm, I am undiagnosed, but I know I have ADHD because I'm always no, doing something. No. Always, always, always. Wait, someone in public safety has ADHD? No <laughs> yeah. way. Come on. Um, but I, I've got to be functioning. I've got to be doing something. So night shift was not good for me because yeah. there's so much just lull and my mind would get racing and I'm like, okay, I got a list of 97 things to do that I've made up in my head that don't really exist, but I feel like I need to do it. Mm -hmm. So it was like, Hey, stop making extra work for yourself and focus on you. Um, so it was really refocusing myself on me for the first time in a really long time. Again, dispatcher wellness. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, it, it is when you really dig into a lot of the problems that are out there at the core is dispatcher wellness. It's, it's identifying that you need help, mm -hmm. identifying where you can get that help and then actually doing it. And, you know, you've, we've got several people in this industry over the last, I don't know, five, 10 years that have really turn that into a career, mm -hmm. but the good that they're doing is incredible. And I'm thinking, oh my God, what happened to all these people who needed help five right. years ago? It just, it wasn't there. Right. And how many people, how many good people did we lose in the industry because yeah. there was no help there? So th that's great. When, when I see shining stars like yourself who are smart, bright, and just have that passion, and, and are smart enough to recognize, hey, I had some trauma in my life. I need to go home today. That was a huge decision because it's not easy for a person in your position to go, I got a problem. I yeah. need to walk out of here because that's not your mission. Your mission right. is to stay and do. But right. by staying and doing in that situation, you're not helping anybody. Yeah. And, you know, there's um february of 2023 we lost one of our deputies to suicide oh, um so as soon as like my director called me and was like i don't want you to hear this from somebody else because you know you just lost your brother i want you to hear this from me so that you're not hearing incorrect stories right. um so the first thing i did i was like i need to go to my people like I need to go see these people that are working in dispatch and make sure they're okay. They're the ones that got the calls. They're the ones that are dealing with it right now. And uh, my significant, my significant other, like we're laying in bed going to sleep. And he's like, do you think that's going to help them when they see you? And he's like, because some people still see the trauma. Some people still see you as trauma. And I said, honestly, it's either going to help them to say, hey, she made it out of it. So it's going to maybe give them some hope or it's going to say, it's going to, in raw terms, it's going to break them and they shouldn't be there answering the calls tonight either. Great so. point. Great point. You know what? It's and, and I believe in that. Give me the straight truth. And if it mm -hmm. hurts me, okay, that's doing good too, because it's getting me either way. It's getting me out of the situation right. through it or out of it. And if I'm out of it, cause I shouldn't be there, I'm less likely to impact others right? and, and amplify a bad situation and make right. it worse. Wow. What a great point. You're amazing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and you answer 911 calls and you're yep. a commander. Wow. Yep. <laughs> and you got a cool name like Danica. So I'm a big name person. What does Danica mean? Um, so it's Slavic and it actually means morning star. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm Slavic on my mother's side. Mm -hmm. You grew up with good cooking from grandma. Let yeah. Me tell oh, you. yeah. <laughs> my mother, who's 96 now, could never make dumplings like my grandmother used to make. And he used to drive her nuts. And I wouldn't help. Let's go to grandma's. I want dumplings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my dad's the same way. My dad's like, um, because my grandma passed when I was four, but I still remember, like, I remember, like, rolling, and there's pictures of me rolling dumplings and rolling the dough, and my dad's just like, yeah, nobody can make it like my mom did. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, trying. Good food. Chicken paprikash. And, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's, I don't meet a lot of Slovak people because the Czechoslovakia was mm -hmm. two countries, Czech and Slovak. And there's a lot of Czech people, but not, you don't hear Slovak mm -hmm. a whole lot. And it's, it's to someone who is Slovak, it's different enough mm -hmm. to where, no, I'm Slovak. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that cooking was, I had cooked Slovak on one side and I had Bavarian German on the, on my dad's mm -hmm. side. So, you know. I ate good when I was a kid. That's all yeah. I can say. <laughs> no one went hungry around dinner time. That's true. No, 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 that's fantastic. So what advice do you have for somebody who's starting out their ENP and going, you know what? I'm not sure if I should do it. And and I'm afraid. And yeah, do is it. going to be good for my career? Yeah, What's do it. Advice? You deserve it. You deserve the time to focus on yourself. You deserve to prove to yourself that you're worth it. You deserve it all. You deserve the knowledge. You deserve the paper. You you deserve it. Now, you haven't got your ENP box. I haven't. FedEx says it's supposed to be here today. So you are going to be super super surprised. I don't want to spoil it, but I can tell you the team worked probably close to a year on the box, the presentation, the contents, and everything that's in there. And what I've heard from everybody that's gotten the box has been, oh my God. And you think you feel special now? Wait till you see what's coming in the mail today. Yeah. I, I hope it doesn't get delayed. I'll probably be so upset. It should be delivered on a red velvet pillow. <laughs> That's how special it is. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, you'll have to catch up with me sometime and let me know uh, when you when you open the box. Stand back because it does explode. <laughs> okay. There's a lot of confetti and that, that gold glitter goes all over the place. But, okay. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for that. I, I know. Trust me. Someone's going to go, Fletcher, don't do that right. Anyway, well, listen, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. You are just, you're the reason I do these podcasts. I, I look for these people that are inspirational. Um, you've made a career out of 911. You're a commander. Wow. I don't think I've ever talked to a commander before. That's pretty, that's a pretty cool title. Actually. Yeah. I like it. Commander Lubolt. Oh, yeah. Wow. You get saluted. Sometimes, yeah. Do you wear uniforms or, or civvies? Um, so we have, we have, um, collared shirts that we can wear with khakis or whatever, or we can, um, do business professional. Okay. What business do most people wear? Um, normally just slacks and, um, a nice t-shirt is normally what, or a nice dress shirt is what most people wear. Um, a lot of the men that work here wear the collared shirts and khakis. Okay. Or button ups. When I, when I was dispatching, I was actually, I was a sworn officer as well. Mm -hmm. I was a special officer. So I full uniform tie. I carried on the desk. I mm -hmm. mean, it was, you know, and I'm like, why do I have a 357 and I'm in dispatch, you know, <laughs> but whatever. Uh, it was kind of cool. And I was waiting to go on the road, actually. Oh, yeah. I passed civil service. I was number one, but the town was so small. They were just never going to be hiring. And I wanted to get into IT. And you know what? I think I'm doing better for the world yeah. on this side with that knowledge of the other side and absolutely I get to stay current by talking to great people like you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the, the best thing I think about like our clothing is our division manager allows us to wear jeans on Fridays and the weekends. Okay. Um, and we're allowed to wear t-shirts as long as they are sport appropriate. So you'll get a lot of, um, a lot of competition whenever sports season goes on and we, and football, you'll get your Gator fans and we're, you know, I'm from Columbia County, which is closer to Tallahassee in my opinion. Um, so you'll get those Seminole fans and like myself and we'll, um, <laughs> we get to debate football all year long. Wow. So. Well, that's good. And, and that is, you know what, you got to be relaxed. Do you deal with the public in the center? Um, Any just, face to face? Nope. Mm -mm, okay. Not yet. We don't have any video calls, and the only the only face to face we get is whenever they come in for um, tours, which we we offer tours um, to the public. They can always come in and see what we're doing, and we allow um, we allow what we call observers, so they can fill out the paperwork and they can come observe and sit with us. Um, but it's very rare that we get any anymore. 
So you allow the public to come in and be an observer mm -hmm. with uh, obviously proper clearance checks. Proper clearance, and, right. You don't want Ted Bundy walking <clears throat> in the front right. door. Yeah, right. Could he live down there, by the way? Mm -hmm. you know, right. Gainesville, Ted Bundy, you know, right. that's, that's what you're known for. Yeah, we're also known for Danny Rollins and the student murders yeah. that of, of the 1990, so. Yep, absolutely. Wow. Mm -hmm. Beautiful area of Florida, though. Great place to grow up, I imagine. It is. It is. All right. Well, listen, Danica, I appreciate you sitting down. You, you've, you've made my day a great day. So I've got, I've got a lot of inspiration throughout the day. Hopefully you've inspired a few other people. What a great story. And thanks so much for sharing your tragedies yeah. you know, with, with us. I mean, that's, that's not an easy thing to do. So I give you a lot of credit for that. I mean, that really, you know, I tell you, God bless you. Yeah. It makes me who I am. And I didn't want other people to not suffer in silence. I want them to know other people are dealing with terrible things too. So you're not alone. It's okay to be not okay. It is. All right. Well, listen, thanks very much and uh, good talking to you. Thank you. Well, that wraps up this episode of Off the Cuff, Confessions of an ENP. I'm Mark Fletcher, ENP, and I'm the Vice President of Public Safety Solutions at 911 and 4. Off the Cuff is sponsored by 911 Inform, delivering next generation 911 solutions to the enterprise today and making every second count. Visit them on the web at 911inform.com. Remember, you can follow me on Twitter at Fletch911. Check out all my blogs and podcasts at Fletch.tv. And be sure to like and subscribe below. That way you'll be immediately notified whenever a new podcast is published. Thanks so much for listening. If you're in public safety, thanks for what you do. Take care and have a great day.